When using machine learning to analyze business data, one of the most important factors in crafting useful models is feature engineering. In this lesson, we'll arrive at an intuition as to what feature engineering actually entails in terms of the work that you do. Feature engineering is a broad subject area, so we're not going to be able to cover everything in this course. For those of you that are interested, additional resources are listed in the lesson page below this video. There are books, there are some articles, so you can learn a lot more about this fascinating aspect of machine learning. So here's a working definition from Wikipedia about feature engineering. Feature engineering is the process of using domain knowledge to extract features from raw data via data mining techniques. These features can be used to improve the performance of machine learning algorithms. This is a great working definition. Using this definition, here are some key ideas that you need to have in your mind when you're thinking about what is feature engineering? Why do I do it? What are the ramifications of doing it? So first up, machine learning algorithms are not guaranteed to learn from your data. You can pull a bunch of data from your data warehouse or from an Excel spreadsheet or an API. Who knows where you're getting the data from? Just because you have it in a particular format does not mean that machine learning algorithms are going to learn anything from the data. The data could just be plain wrong, or alternatively, it might not necessarily be in a format that is useful to the machine learning algorithm in terms of its ability to learn what's going on in your data. Now, here's something else that's really important. Machine learning algorithms might learn the wrong things from your data. Think overfitting. You can engineer features that the CART algorithm, if it has the right hyperparameter settings, will memorize, will overfit. It will learn the wrong things from your data. It won't learn generalizable patterns. It will just learn what it's presented. We'll do an example on the next slide using dates and times to really cement this idea that it's entirely possible that your data representation by default will allow the machine learning algorithm to learn the wrong thing. So feature engineering is the process of crafting optimal data representations for machine learning. That's really what it's about, is to take what data that you have at your disposal, extract features from the raw data, and present that data in such a way that the machine learning algorithm says, sweet, I can work with this, I can identify the patterns in the data. So not surprisingly, feature engineering is more of an art than a science. And in particular, it is an art where domain knowledge is key, especially in business analytics. If you're using machine learning to help you analyze your business data, domain knowledge is going to be key because extracting features that actually make sense for your business and presenting them in such a way that the machine learning algorithm can pick up on those patterns in your data requires that you actually know what's going on in the business in the first place. At the very least, it requires you to know what the data is. So for example, if you're pulling data from a data warehouse, you need to understand what the database columns actually mean in order to use them effectively. That's one example of domain knowledge. Now this is a key idea. Feature engineering typically adds complexity because typically what you're doing is you're not necessarily replacing one feature with another feature, a one-for-one -one exchange from a less optimal representation to a more optimal representation. Typically what you're doing is you're actually adding more features to your data set, more features to your data frame, more columns to your data frame. And as we know from CART, that can increase the complexity of the model. The more features you have, depending on what hyperparameters you're using to do the bias variance trade-off, your trees are typically going to be larger the more features that you have, especially if those features are predictive. So not surprisingly, given all this, feature engineering can easily lead to overfitting if you're not careful. This is this careful balancing act that you have to execute as a professional using machine learning. You know already that to craft useful models, you typically have to add complexity, but you don't want to add too much. Feature engineering not only adds complexity, but if you don't do it carefully, you can make it very easy for your algorithms to overfit. And in particular, as we well know, the CART algorithm is designed to overfit when it can. So keep all this in the back of your mind and you'll be able to do awesome feature engineering. So lastly, and I just want to emphasize this point, 
when you're analyzing business data with machine learning, feature engineering is often the most critical aspect of the whole process for creating useful models. Generally speaking, a lot of times in the business world, the raw data that you have access at your disposal is not in an optimal format for machine learning models. And in the next slide, we'll characterize one particular common form of data that almost always needs feature engineering, and that is date and time data. When analyzing business data, one of the most common features that you care about relates to dates and times, or commonly referred to as timestamps. Almost every business scenario that I've ever analyzed in my career as a hands-on analytics professional involved some sort of time aspect. It's just the way business works. Things happen over time, so you typically analyze over time. So when working with timestamp data, here's a good rule of thumb. Never use the timestamps as is in your training, validation, or testing data. You always want to engineer features from the raw timestamps. So to really cement this idea, let's go with a hypothetical example. Here we have essentially just a table of data. I made it up. And let's say we have a feature called conversion date. So this is the timestamp when somebody converted. Either they signed up for an email newsletter or maybe they bought something. Who knows? Conversion date. And this is a timestamp because it has a date component here and a time component. Notice the time is in 24-hour format. Generally speaking, if you're using a US-style format with AM, PM, it doesn't really matter. The same basic principle applies. Now take this data as is, these two representations being the example, and think about the card algorithm. Think about how it works deep down inside, what it optimizes for, the fact that it's greedy. What would card do with this data in this representation? Well, not surprisingly, when you think of it in those terms, timestamps are a type of feature that usually leads to overfitting. In fact, I have actually seen this before. I have seen models that used timestamps just like this and didn't do anything with them. They just fed them as is into the machine learning model. And guess what? The model that in question was tree-based. It used decision trees. So the individual decision trees latched onto this and said, wow, I can do a lot with this because these individual timestamps actually tell me quite a bit. So if you just imagine some sort of label here, let's just say a binary classification scenario of yes, no. And let's say this one's yes and this one's no. The trees literally learn, hey, if the date is February 11th, 2021, and the time is 1.43 and 13 seconds p.m., then yes. If the date is the 7th of December, 2020, at 8 o'clock in the morning, or approximately 8 o'clock in the morning, then no. So these timestamps as this, in this format, are ripe for overfitting depending on what kind of algorithm you're using. Since we're using tree-based algorithms in this course, and by the way, which are very commonly used in practice in the real world, not surprisingly, they will memorize this if they can. Even more specifically, if you have the quote-unquote right hyperparameters, CART is going to memorize these individual timestamps. It's just going to happen. For example, if you have min bucket set to 1, you're probably going to get some pretty gnarly trees. They're going to be huge, but basically at the end, the leaf nodes are going to be individual dates. If those features, these individual values, split the data perfectly, a CART algorithm will memorize the data as such. So, not surprisingly, you want to typically extract timestamp features to allow for patterns in the timestamp data, in this type of data, to be learned by the algorithm, but in such a way that it does not make the algorithm overfit to these representations. And we're going to see what that looks like in the next slide. A key idea in feature engineering is extracting the representations that embody patterns in the data while simultaneously avoiding overfitting, as we saw in the last slide. Timestamps are a great example of this because everyone in the world is familiar with these types of patterns. Everybody has domain expertise in the concepts of dates and times because we're just used to it. So take the following engineered features. So you can see over here, I have the original conversion dates here. And then I have a bunch of features that I engineered from these original timestamps. And notice 
how these features are just some of the patterns that can be extracted from timestamps. So for example, notice that I explicitly have a column now, a feature for the month, February and December. I also have one for the week of the year. So this date corresponds to the seventh week of the year, depending on how you set up your calendar. Just go with it for right now. And this date is in week 50 of the year. I can also explicitly say the day of the month. This is the 11th day of the month. This is the seventh day of the month. Day of the week, hour, minute, so on and so forth. But the possibilities are much more diverse than this. You could have quarter of the year, for example. You could have first half of the year, the second half of the year. You could have seasonality types of features like, is it spring or winter or summer, depending on how you want that to be represented in your data. So much data, so many patterns can be extracted from just this simple representation and exploded out across a number of features. But notice this, there is a lot less likelihood of overfitting with representations like this rather than this. Now, one thing that I want to really call out here because it's super important is, notice that in this simple example, and you could certainly engineer a lot more features than this if you wanted to from a timestamp, but let's just say this is what you start with. Notice that a single feature, so this original feature has now been replaced with six, because of course I'm not gonna actually feed this into the algorithm for training. I'm gonna take this out and use these six representations instead of the original timestamp. So the single feature has been replaced with six features. Given what you know about CART, the CART algorithm, the way it works, do you think that adding a net of five new features, because remember we had one feature originally, so take this one out, and then we're adding five more. So we're increasing the total number of features by a net of five. Do you think this is gonna increase complexity? Given what you know about CART and given what you know about optimizing CART for the bias variance trade-off. Do you think this is gonna increase complexity? Probably. If any of these features are actually useful, if they're actually predictive, the CART algorithm will pick them depending on your hyperparameter values. And typically what you're doing is you're increasing complexity, as you well know. So if you're giving it more features that it could possibly use, it's likely that your trees are gonna be more complex, especially if they're predictive. If they're not predictive, then the CART algorithm will just ignore them. Now, let me ask you this as well. Once again, given what you know about CART, what are some of the patterns that a tree could potentially learn from the above features? So for example, what we might find is that conversion actually happens more often in the latter part of the week. So let's say, for example, maybe Friday, Saturday, Sunday, maybe corresponding to the weekends you might find that more people interact with your website or your newsletter or your e-commerce store, who knows, later in the week than they do earlier in the week. That's the kind of pattern that can be learned from a day of the week feature. You might also find hours of the day. You might find that more people convert in the evening because maybe they're home from work and they have more time to actually surf the web and go to your website, who knows? Click on your ads, I don't know. But generally speaking, you can, I'm sure, think of, brainstorm a whole bunch of different scenarios of the kinds of patterns in the data that a decision tree could learn in terms of conversion much more elegantly, much more in a feature-rich kind of way, no pun intended, than just using the simple raw timestamp. Okay, so that's the core idea. We're all familiar with dates and times, and this is the essence of feature engineering. We're going to extract features. We're going to extract data representations that embody patterns in the original feature using our domain knowledge that allow for our machine learning models to potentially pick up on things that the original representation wouldn't make possible. With that intuition, next up we need to talk about row versus column feature engineering. The last feature engineering intuition we need is this idea of row versus column feature engineering. Now, not surprisingly, in the case of row-based feature engineering, all the data used to engineer the new features is contained within the row itself. So what we saw on the last slide, not surprisingly, is an example of row-based feature engineering. All of these new features that were engineered, all of this information came from right here. 
all the data that was needed was within the row, was within the observation itself. Now, not surprisingly, in comparison, column-based feature engineering requires data from multiple rows. And what I have here is, once again, a hypothetical example. This is actually built from the adult census data set. And what you can see here is the occupation feature from the adult census data set, the hours per week feature. These two can come out of the box with the data set. And I've engineered two new features. Now, first up, this feature right here, average hours by occupation. What this tells you is in the data set, for everybody who has an occupation of ADM clerical, administrative clerical, the average hours per week that people with this occupation work is 37.56 approximately. And you can see that particularly here because we have two rows of data for the handlers cleaners. And you can see here that the feature value is exactly the same because this is the average number of hours per week that people with this occupation in the data set work. So this column right here is a column-based feature engineering scenario because to calculate these individual values that you see here, I had to use multiple rows of data in the data set to come up with these numbers. And lastly, we have this feature right here that I engineered, and I'm gonna call this, for lack of a better term, a hybrid feature. And the reason for that is, is it is using a combination of data calculated from multiple rows, and it's derived from data only within the row. So basically, this right here is the hours per week of this individual observation divided by the average hours by occupation. And what this tells you is, is that this particular person has works 106% of the occupational average because 40 is greater than 37.56, and it's about 6.5% larger than the average. And you can see the other calculations down here. Now, this is the kind of feature engineering that you do commonly see. This idea of like, oh, okay, well, maybe people who work more than the average, given their occupation, might be more likely to make more than $50,000 a year. This idea of like, if you work harder, if you work longer, you're rewarded for it. So this is the kind of thing that you commonly see in feature engineering, but you need to be careful because when you use column-based feature engineering, there is a potential for what is known as data leakage. You have to be careful when you use column-based feature engineering. Data leakage is the subject of the next lesson in this section, but just I want to keep this really simple. Generally speaking, you can do the, all the row-based feature engineering that you would like. Generally speaking, you don't really need to worry about it, especially when you're doing things something like this where you're taking a bad feature, a feature that is going to engender overfitting, and then you break it out into a representation where more generalizable patterns could be learned from the data by the machine learning algorithm. This kind of stuff you can basically do without too much worry. Once you start going with column-based, that's where things get more complicated. And as I said, that is the subject of the next lesson.